everyone, we are joined here today with the wonderful Ed and LinkedIn influencer. And we're with Ed today for him to take us on his journey from homeless veteran to global LinkedIn influencer. So Ed, I'd love you to share a little bit with us about your journey. Like how, how did you get into that situation of being a veteran for our country to homeless? Yeah, well, um, I was going to say, honour to be on your wonderful show, Elizabeth, and it's an absolute pleasure. And uh, in summary, uh, I went from, there were two things that led to me becoming a homeless veteran. Number one was, one contributing factor was PTSD, like post-traumatic stress disorder from an injury. However, I don't think that, and I always think about this like a decade later on reflection as I become an old man, right? What I actually think it was, it was, a combination of PTSD, but the real problem was scarcity thinking. It was the lack of abundance, the lack of gratitude, it was scarcity thinking that led, it set the stage for me to make a range of poor decisions to put me in that position. So I just want to say this very clearly. I don't blame the government. I'm not following that narrative. I actually blame myself, but I blame the scarcity thinking that I think was really the key contributor that put me in that position. Yeah, and how, how long were you homeless for, Ed? I was about 10, 11 months, give or take. There was a few, um, a few storyline arcs in that experience. But I like to say about 10 or 11 months as a, as a good underestimate. And, yeah, it was a very uh, transformational experience. And, uh, ironically, it was the, one of the best chances of my life to really move from a place of scarcity thinking, which put me there, to yeah. a place of abundance thinking. How did you get to that point where you just kind of knew you needed to change your mindset to that abundance from that scarcity? What was that point for you where you went, no, this isn't working anymore. I need to do something different. Yeah, well, what happened was, and um, when I realized I'm going to be spending a little bit of time homeless, when I sort of, you know, reality hit, right? And, you know, and, and that's another conversation. It's sort of preparing to be homeless is a very, very dark thing to go through, right? Preparing to be homeless. And when I was making the preparations for that stage of that darker stage of my life, that was kind of when the penny dropped then because I knew it was my fault. Ultimately, like, there, were, there, there were some external factors and PTSD and having severe anxiety is not fun. However, and I do say this a decade later upon reflection, it was... I could see how my poor quality thinking set the stage for this to occur. And that's and the, the penny dropped actually before I was homeless, right? So before, before I was officially homeless, I'm yeah. like, yeah, I can see how I put myself in this position. And, uh, and ironically being homeless actually wasn't that bad because that was, because I already, I already had the penny drop before it happened. It was more just the process playing out. Mm. What was that kind of like internal narrative you were telling yourself before you became homeless? So I know you've talked about that scarcity mindset, but what were those internal stories you were telling yourself before the penny dropped? One of the biggest lies I used to tell myself was I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy. And that used to be so uh, now saying it, you know, where I am today, it seems almost laughable. But at the time, that was just such a real part of my DNA. I was so ingrained into that servant, surf, peasant sort of thinking, right? And, uh, and, and I do call it peasant thinking. Thinking you're not worthy is, I think, the basis for peasant thinking. You need an overlord or a master to rule over you, right? Yep. And yep. It was, I, that was often part of it. A core part of it was I'm not worthy, but that was such a core part of my DNA, it just destroyed my whole game plan. Because even though I was... You know, I did quite well in the government and I had um, quite a successful corporate career for a while there. I always had that poisonous thinking just yanking me down and and eventually it led to my destruction. That's it. And that, and when it led to my destruction, I realized how poisonous this, and I call it brainwashing. I was brainwashed into thinking that and this brainwashing ended up destroying me. Mm. And was there any external factors that reinforced that internal story that you were telling yourself, I'm not worthy? Was there... Was there like comments from other people or was there situations that kind of helped you internalize that belief that you were not worthy? Yeah, well, I made some very, very, before I met the wonderful Lassie, of course, like, you know, a decade later, I made some very poor relationship choices. Um, And in these relationship choices, uh, the, you know, the, the women I was with would reinforce that narrative. And also too, I'm going to have a shot at the fake news now for the moment. And, and, and it's even worse than what it was a decade ago. Whenever you turn on the TV, 
It's all negativity. They're all telling you you're going to fail. It's all about keeping that fear mode. So I'll give it a combination of uh, fake news as well as what I was telling myself. And um, a certain Miss Piggy might be joining us as well. Just to let you know, we're Hi. in the park right now. And um, Miss Piggy has a new bicycle. Say hello. Hi. Oh, no. Oh, oh, no. Are you okay? I'm okay, Mommy. She's all right. <laughs> She's, she's okay. Right. She didn't yeah. want to tell you she's okay, but mummy, she's told. <laughs> so, so there she is. Um, so so uh, this is her first day riding the bicycle, actually. I can so. ride my bike now, Daddy. There we go. Wow. <laughs> well done. Okay. Yeah, so there you go. Yeah, I'm going to ride my bike now. Daddy. There we go. Wow. <laughs> well done. Okay. Efra, be careful now. Mummy's around the other side, so it's not, I'm not being a bad parent. Mummy's over there. <laughs> So I'm not being a bad parent. Mum, mum is here. <laughs> so we were just talking about how you kind of had the, like the negative news, and you were being that info, like yeah. just repeating kind of that you're not worthy, and being, I guess, exposed to stories that tell us we're not good enough. That life isn't for us; it's for someone else. And, and just on that note, I know, and I know you're a very savvy coach, Liz, but so I know you're totally red pilled on this issue, and you probably know it better than I do. Um, when, okay, if you, let's say, believe you're not worthy, you'll then attract people and partners and situations that reinforce that reality. So if someone said to, said to me today, I'm not worthy, I'd throw something at them or block them, right? Like, yep. but, but in those days, oh, that, that fed into my reality. So mm. if you, and, and it's the old, and, and pardon me for playing on tropes or stereotypes here, but it's like when you see, you know, the really attractive, cool chick date a bum, right? Yeah. And if you actually peel back the layers, what's really going on is that poor girl has a low view of herself, which is why this predator bum can take advantage of her. It, it, in a way, I sort of played out a male version of that reality. Yeah. And what was it? So you said before you actually became homeless that Penny had already dropped. Yes. But is, was there a defining moment that you remember when that Penny did drop for you? Yeah, when I was, um, because I, I, I was homeless with a car. So, and just to, as a caveat, when you've got a car, it's like homeless light, so to speak. So real homeless is no car. With a car is like homeless light. So I'll just make that caveat, right? So I, I, technically homeless, but it's homeless light. It's like Diet yeah. Coke. It's not real Coke, right? Um, but it's when I was, I remember when I was packing my car and I was like, Ed, what happened to you? You know, what, this is a, such a tragic fall from grace. And, hmm. and I really knew I could then, I then started to get clear. It was my poisonous brainwashing and thinking. A again, it was that even though, look, I was suffering from very bad anxiety from the PTSD and that was a problem. That was a problem, hmm. right? So I, I can't downplay that. But ultimately, I think the 60% plus of the issue was that poison. So as I was packing my car, to leave so, um, this, that's when i actually moved from hobart to sydney at the time another story um that's when the penny dropped it's like man i was such a high i was i was such a high flying character and look at me now mm. and i put myself here i did this it was the brainwashing that has put me in the situation mm. so you've packed up your car that penny has dropped you have realized that you are responsible for where you ended up and you have the ability to change that and you've started this road trip from Hobart to Sydney. What did you do on that road trip to work on yourself and start to change around that negative thought pattern of you're not worthy to a more positive story that you were telling yourself? Well, I started, um, I already started, I, I believed I could change because that penny drop, because the thing is, I suppose I've already failed and been successful. Before. So uh, without, I don't want to go too much into the details here, but I got, I almost died when I was injured uh, with the government uh, military. And I came back from that and became a successful corporate, right? So the fact that I already had almost died and made a comeback, that gave me faith that I could pull it off again. So mm. it, it wasn't the first time I started with nothing. You know, I, I started basically dying and coming back, right? So it's like, well, like I've come back, you know, I've come back from death. I can surely come back from this setback, right? So I had that underpinning belief uh, that I would do it. And the other thing is as well, and again, just as a, as a caveat, I'm going to talk about Jesus and religion for the moment. Um, <laughs> open all religions. So, you know, I love Islam, Christianity, um, Buddhists and Taoists, and I've even got a few Wiccan clients. So we love our Wiccans too. So, um, but yeah, as a Christian, um, I was already a Christian well before that. So I had a very good spiritual foundation that really helped me sort of work through that darker part of my life. Hmm. And, 
at what stage did you kind of come attached to LinkedIn? We know that's your platform of choice and it has where you have built up this fantastic community that's enabled you to have the life you have today. When did that penny drop for you that, hey, I, I want to do this. I want to build this community. I want to help others. Ironically, it was only about two years ago, right? Ironically of LinkedIn. So uh, I was in, so I had a few jobs. Uh, I'm just condensing the story, make it more interesting. Yeah. But I had a few jobs. Uh, originally, I became quite success locally. And I say locally on a Sydney level, I became locally successful using Meetup and Facebook. Mm. Uh, but, the, but then it hit a wall, right? I hit that wall. But it was about two years ago. Uh, it's like a year before the pandemic was that one of my friends suggested I get in a LinkedIn and it was interesting. I achieved more, and I'm not exaggerating when I say this, I achieved more in three months on LinkedIn than I did in five years on Facebook in terms of community growth, sales and engagement. And, uh, and what I realized that what, what the real pain drop was is that uh, LinkedIn was the place for me. I just, I'm suited to LinkedIn. I'm the sort of character for LinkedIn. And Originally, I jumped on LinkedIn just to get more clients. And then I turned into a global LinkedIn influencer. Then everyone's like, Ed, we're not interested in your coaching anymore. Teach us how to become influencers. So it's sort of like, oh, okay, well, well bye-bye to the coaching. I'm now an influencer coach. Hey, everyone. So it was a, my own unexpected success there. It, it changed my business for the better. It, it was a mess. I went from sort of that business coach marketing guy to the global influencer coach, which I absolutely love, by the way. But it was an unexpected transformation, which I'm really grateful for. But it's being open to that opportunity, isn't it? Like opportunities are around us all the time. And I talk to many, many people who just don't see them. So what's your kind of like a mindset tip or tip to being able to see that opportunity? Like you were this marketing coach supporting people on a journey, but then you started to get this feedback of, hey, no, you're killing it on LinkedIn. You need to tell people how to do that. What... What mindset enabled you to be open to that story and taking on that story and going with the door that was open for you? Yeah. Much like yourself, Elizabeth, and I know we've had many conversations about this off camera. I mean, you and I are very similar. We're both intelligent people. You know, you know when it's a great opportunity because at the end of the day, as a coach, your clients tell you what they want, right? So in, in my business, people very rarely buy something from me without talking to me first. The odd person does. But usually people will talk to me at least for 30 seconds before they buy something, right? Yeah. And they tell you straight up what they're after. It's like, Ed, um, Ed I've, I've seen what you do on LinkedIn. Um, Ed, I've seen what you do on Meetup. Ed, I've been to your live webinars. I want to do that. So people tell you straight up what they're after. And and this was, so I'm just getting my years right. So, 2020, so it was the start of 2019, like before the pandemic hit uh, and all the governments went in a crazy lockdown. It was the start of 2019 when I did the big, the big change big change which was good because if I didn't do that I would have be out of business so I, I was very lucky granted I didn't know the pandemic was coming but the changes I made were very pandemic compatible a year earlier so it's very lucky mm. on that one well I think happens for a reason right and it's being as long as we we don't understand at the time but generally speaking you you switched up a year early to being online and that's it happened for a reason, right? Like we didn't know why at the time, but you know now that it was because the pandemic was coming and you've made managed to safeguard it. What would be your tip to someone who is kind of not necessarily wanting to be on LinkedIn, but just in a space where they don't, they're not happy where they are, but they're struggling to see the other opportunities. What, would you say to that person how how can they open their eyes to see the world that is around them and see the opportunities that are created for them by the conversations and interactions they have yeah well the first uh, two, probably three things first thing is stop watching tv don't watch the fake news and um tv i'll I just say it tv is now worse 10 years than it was uh, 10 years ago so the amount of propaganda and fake news is through the roof and the tv just pushes failure nonstop. It's all about, you can't do this. This big issue is coming. Fear, fear, fear. So first thing is, if you are watching regular TV, stop it or at least red pill yourself. So remember, you know, there is this fake reality that they're trying to create to control you. So when you accept there's this whole fake reality and you know it's true, then it makes life a lot easier. So turn off the fake news and turn off the TV. The second thing is talk to the right, such as people like yourself. Um, people should definitely hire a coach much like Elizabeth Horton. So 
get someone who's a professional like legendary Elizabeth, someone who can help red pill you faster. And I think thirdly, um, I actually say we go on a holiday. If you can try and pull yourself out of your current situation mm. so you can spend a bit of time alone, like going on a holiday may not be realistic for you, but even if you can spend a few hours off or go somewhere on your own and think about things, that's very important. Yeah. For me, I absolutely love, I live right by the water where I am and I walk down every morning and love just sitting in that peace and calm and having that clear headspace with nothing else around, no TV, no one to disrupt me. And yeah. that really does change your mindset by creating that space for you. And yes, Ed and I both know we are, can't all go on holiday right now, but you yeah, do yeah. have the ability to create that headspace wherever you are. You don't need to jump on a plane or go to the beach to do that. You have the ability within you to do it where you are what would you say ed so they're your three tips for someone else but for you like going from you know the fighting for our country to homeless veteran to some jobs in between for moving from hobart to sydney to marketing coach to linkedin influencer what has been your biggest learning through that whole journey you've been on if you had to pick one what would you say is like the biggest learning that really transformed everything for you? Yeah, being consistent is everything uh, because through all the bumps and troughs, all, all the peaks and troughs, I should say, it's been my consistent behavior that's put me on top. So for example, whether I'm feeling awesome or terrible, I'll still keep posting. And that behavior, if I gave into my emotions and only post when I feel like it, we wouldn't be talking now. So it's that consistent streak that has helped me kept growing and growing. So for example, I grow usually on my personal page, I usually grow at least 200 followers a day on my business page. I usually grow four, 500 followers a day, right? And the growth's incredible. If I stop posting, that won't happen. Yeah. You know, so I'm only growing by lots of followers because I'm posting all the time. The moment I stop, that all stops. And so I'd say consistent behavior is everything. Absolutely everything. Yeah. And with that, Ed, like you're so high energy. And as you know, I came to one of your meetups in Sydney a little while ago and there was another person there and they said to me, how does Ed manage to like always have this absolute high energy and incredible presence? What is, what is your secret? Like, how do you do that? How do you always bring this mass energy to everything you do that comes through in the videos you do, the podcasts you do when you're speaking live in front of people, or even like those text posts you do, like we can feel your energy, like jumping out of our PC screens. How do you do that? <laughs> yeah. Well, I think the first thing is, is that um, you got to know when to turn it on and turn it off. So I'm very good at shutting down. Right. So for example, um, and just for the sake of the audience, I come from a, I'm a Middle Eastern Australian, so Persian Australian. And um, quite common in the Middle East is having siestas, sleep in the afternoon. It's a very Middle Eastern thing to do, right? So not possible for everyone, but what I personally do is if I can, I sleep for an hour or two in the afternoon. And, uh, that's, and that's anyone from a Middle Eastern or a Latino or a background will know what I'm talking about here, right? Um, that makes you feel really good. And a lot of um, health professionals say having, even if you can sleep for 10 minutes in the afternoon, like a power nap, it makes you so much healthier. And I've done that before. I've done, I find a 10 minute power nap in the afternoon can really set you up for a great evening. So it's sort of the way you manage your energy. So for example, um, I knew I was speaking to the legendary Elizabeth Horton. So um, I'm drinking a lot of coffee this morning <laughs> and after we finish, I'll be, I'll deflate for a while, but I'll just chill out and relax and get my energy back. So firstly, it's managing your energy. You got to know how to turn it on and also turn it off equally. That's the first point I would say. Okay, that's fantastic. And then just finally, what is it you would tell one person right now who is struggling with that scarcity mindset? What, what would you say to them? What would you tell them to do? Yeah, I would say turn off the TV, turn off the fake news and probably speak to someone like Elizabeth Horton or speak to Elizabeth Horton, <laughs> even just reach out to Elizabeth on LinkedIn and say, hi, Elizabeth. I watch your podcast of Ed. I'm struggling with scarcity. Talk to me. And I think in, in all seriousness, reaching out to someone, a professional such as yourself is the first place to start. Other avenues, jump on YouTube, watch a few videos. But I'm always a fan of if you find someone you like, I, again, if, they, if you're watching this podcast, if you watch this far, you obviously like Elizabeth Horton, definitely speak to her to kick it off. 
Perfect. Well, thank you ever so much, Ed. Do you want to just share with all of my listeners and followers how they can connect with you and join your international networking um, virtually and also in person? Oh, you're the best. So the best way to do it is um, feel free to add me on LinkedIn. Uh, just say that you you know, you saw this interview, so I know who you are. And also, too, if you want an introduction, feel free to bounce back to Elizabeth Horton. She can always connect us as well. And um, we run a lot of um, webinars, meetups. And if you don't mind me saying, um, you don't mind if I let the Central Coast cat out of the bag? No, go for it. Let the Central Coast cat out of the bag. <laughs> so Elizabeth is also one of our wonderful meetup leaders with a focus on the Central Coast, which is like in New South Wales. So, um, yeah, please go to Elizabeth as well. She knows the ins and outs of our community as well. Perfect. Thank you ever so much for joining us today, Ed, and sharing all of your wonderful tips and journey with us. Thank you. Honorable pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And make sure you reach out to Elizabeth Horton and hire her big time. <laughs>